you doing? I'm Van. Apologies in advance if there are the sounds of explosions in the background on occasion. It is the 4th of July, and yes, I am spending my 4th <gasps> watching Captain Planet. Our world is in peril. Gaia, the spirit of the Earth, can no longer... But Captain Planet's a weird show. I know I'm not really surprising anybody with that statement. Anybody who's ever actually sat down and watched an episode of Captain Planet can kind of attest to the fact that it is a weird show. Originally designed as an educational program, it was sort of like a weird Nepo baby of Ted Turner's that ended up getting six seasons despite being bad from the jump. Not one of the episodes on any of the six seasons have like higher than like a 7.5 on IMDb. I'm exaggerating a little bit, I think. I think a couple of them are in, like, the 7.8 range, but only a couple. And there's 113 of these bad boys. Like, there are a lot of episodes in Captain Planet. So I decided, ah, uh, what better way to spend the 4th of July than to watch the worst episodes of Captain Planet available? Uh, this is gonna end up being a multi-parter. I didn't really understand how rough Captain Planet was. And I don't just mean in terms of the story being weird or the animation being cheap. I mean everything. We're starting with Season 1, Episode 13, Wonder Dam. The episode opens up with these tribal people on their riverboats, when suddenly, loot and plunder, and then this other guy. This other guy who I love, by the way. One instant dam going down, Mr. Plunder! Is that really his voice? They show up and drop an instant dam directly into the river. And what is an instant dam, you ask? Well, it's a multi-hundred-thousand-ton contraption that they just drop into the river with absolutely no problems whatsoever. I just wish they'd scream louder so I could hear them. Okay, no, that's just what he sounds like. That's not bad line delivery. Alert! Someone is in trouble down there! If only someone could control water, it'd be really helpful. Or, 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 or Kwame, you could use Earth to, like, raise him out of the water. I mean, that would work, right? Like, either, either of these things would be a good option, right? Not if I can help it. Uh, then he okay that, that's the latter there's a there's a strange lack of the planeteers like planeteering in this episode they're mostly just like regular tweens i guess teens something i don't know their ages are ambiguous but they're mostly just people that are just like doing things and that that kind of feels like it was originally the point like they could only use their planeteer powers as something of a last resort but uh just feels like their problems would be solved a lot easier if they actually used their their fucking magic rings <laughs> also didn't didn't he get knocked off is he a good swimmer is that all it is am i overthinking it this is a notepad so loot and plunders arrived to the village to sell appliances to them as part of his scheme to Later on, it's revealed that, like, he's trying to uh, bankrupt them with electricity so he can steal their land afterwards because he now legally owns it, even though he never bought it, just because he supplied them with power. It's really convoluted and also really dumb. Also, these appliance noises. These people need the river. What appliances make that noise? What... What, what tools make those noises? I, I can't, I can't think of a single one. Oh my god, why does he look like that? No time for games! This is no game! Get a load of this fence fried fruit! <laughs> where did he come from? That doesn't make sense, right? Like, based on where they were standing before, to where they're standing now, and where the truck had to come from, there were no roads, there were no pathways, there were no the trucks visible. I have a feeling we're not going to get any answers. We're just going to get more questions. Bye. Everyone profits at plunder. Whose goddamn white baby is that? What the? I'll take care of those. Beat it. Stop nosing around here. Go. 
they won't bother us no more. Oh my god, what a fucking tool. <laughs> like, who is this fucking guy? Why isn't he the main villain? He's the one causing all the ruckus. He's the one being a jerk to animals for no reason and causing destruction and mayhem. He's the one who sounds like an average Australian 16-year-old. <laughs> I didn't do any research on any of the voice actors, um, m minus the fact that, like, there are a lot of people that are actually kind of a big fucking deal in this show. Um, I assume because they were under contract with, uh, Ted Turner, either Fox or TBS or TNT or whatever it is that Ted Turner owns now. But whatever he owned then, they likely were under contract with him, and he threw them at it just to garner attention to the show as his pet project. Something is very wrong here. Ah, yes. A good old-fashioned just summon all the dudes alarm. <laughs> Every worker in the entire factory, clearly, I mean, look how many there are. They had to spend a lot of money to animate this scene. But then, but then this guy's here also. How did he get here? Where was he? What's he been doing? Has he been busy? How did he know they would be here? I don't know. I don't have those answers. This scene raises something interesting about Heart. Because Heart is a little ambiguous as to what it does. But it seems like, at least in this episode, it is telepathy. And whether that's emotional telepathy or actual, like, thought-projecting telepathy, it's left also ambiguous. But Heart seems like a really, really good ability. It's just not immediately destructive. Typically, whenever he uses it, it fails. I will use my ring to try and calm them. It's no use. But that's besides the point. Right now, whenever it works, it's good. It's good stuff. Also, how do they get tied up so fast? Also, how far can they use the rings apart from each other to still summon Captain Planet? How far apart are they now? Why didn't Wheeler just use fire? The power is yours. Oh, hey, oh, and, and he's gone. Okay, alright, so that lasted approximately one minute. You know, for a show called Captain Planet, they really don't use Captain Planet that much. I get he's the problem solver, like, the Planeteers are the ones that try to solve the problem, fail every single time, and then use the power of a god to solve their issues for them. My people realized that they paid too high a price. Are you kidding? It seems like these episodes were animated by different studios in some cases. Or at the very least, certain scenes were thought about as only an afterthought, like when the episode was already almost done in production. I said that sentence weird, but you get what I mean, I hope. If not, well, too fucking bad, I'm not repeating myself. That really stands out to me as some of the worst animation I've ever seen in like a fully animated show. This was the 90s, this wasn't even the 80s or the 70s. There were some phenomenal animations well before that. This is just bad. Gadgets and appliances. But it is too late. It would seem that way. Your crops are ruined. The fish and game are dying. If only one of the planeteers could use their magical ring to move water. Dear me, what's the problem? Couldn't figure out the instructions. You greed monger. I'm terribly sorry, but I didn't come here to argue with you. I came to the fine chief here. What is this? Your electric bill. So this was the point where I, I kind of decided I like loot and plunder. He's a fun guy. Like, he's got some charisma. He's got some some pizzazz to him. Like, he, he's, he puts a little stank on his voice. Like, he's having fun in the booth. He's actually putting in some effort. I'll make them regret this. Since those fools believe in their Niami Niami river god, I'll use it against them. <laughs> I'm going to give them their yummy, yummy, and kick them off my land. Whereas uh, a lot of the other actors and a lot of the other voice actors are clearly not. Uh-oh! What do you mean? I say that. They might have given it their all, and odds are their direction was really, really bad. And a lot of times you run into an issue with this show where the character will deliver their line. Um, in a way that does not fit the situation whatsoever. And that's mostly due to them probably just reusing lines that they didn't originally intend or giving them bad scene direction. Because they don't care about lip flaps in this show, I promise you. They don't, they don't ever match. We're not talking about that because we'd be here all day. Yay! scared with this. 
I'll turn up the volume and give them something to really scream about. Whenever I first started watching this, I was genuinely like, oh my god, he is, well, like, what's he gonna do? Is he gonna, like, lead him to a cliff and threaten him? Is he gonna breathe fire? Like, how, how are the stakes gonna be upped? He just talks to him. And it doesn't even work. Give him your laugh. Do not listen to him! The show's so goddamn stupid. Especially when it's at its stupidest. That is no river god. His heart is as evil as loot and plunders. Wheeler! Fire! Oh yeah, no, Wheeler, fuck, you can do that, right. <laughs> I kinda like the idea of just this himbo, like this super-powered himbo, but he constantly forgets that he has powers and can only be, like, directed to do a thing for a few seconds at a time before he completely forgets whatever he's doing. But if that was a, a, an archetype, like a character trait or a character archetype, that'd be Wheeler, because he never uses his fire. Unless he's threatened, it's, like significantly threatened, like with death. But other than that, he usually will not use his fire. He is very sparing with it. It's out of control! Kwame, do something! <laughs> Kwame! Kwame, do something. Do anything. Do anything at all. Anything your heart desires, just do it. You have the, the power to move Earth. You have the ability to split the land, opening up giant chasm in order for these boulders to tumble in. Do something. Do anything. Please. Kwame doesn't actually do anything this entire episode. And uh, Linka has just kind of vanished. I, I don't I don't know where she is. I, I it seems like she just kind of wandered off. Like she's having her own her own adventures doing something. Our rings aren't gonna cut it by themselves. It's time for teamwork. Then let our powers combine. Didn't he didn't he just like go to sleep? He was just like, oh, oh, that toxic battery acid. Oh, man. Oh, I need to take a break. And then they summon him back because they cannot solve their problems on their goddamn own. By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet. Go Planet! I will say the synth soundtrack in Captain Planet goes hard. Yeah. Don't worry, folks. All of your problems are about to evaporate. <laughs> like, okay, all right, maybe Captain Planet's kind of all right, you know? <laughs> Like, maybe it's kind of cool after all. Maybe, maybe I was wrong this whole time. We will never let the likes of Loot and Plunder cheat us again. Oh, his name's Loot and Plunder. Oh, that's the lesson. I mean, he did just kind of show up and dam their river without their permission, their consent, or their ability to stop him. Not, not really sure how they could have prevented that part of the evil scheme. But yes, maybe you shouldn't, you know, buy things from the man who dropped a dam in your river and killed all the elephants. Go, Planet! Oh, hell yeah, Planeteer Alert time. Let's go, baby! The Planeteer Alert is easily the best part of the entire episode. It feels the most like what Captain Planet was actually supposed to feel like. It feels educational, it feels quick, and it feels like it's not pulling punches. This one really isn't a particularly bad one, but one of the good things that Captain Planet did was not shy away from the more mature aspects of pollution and harming the planet. You see a lot of instances where, like, people die in Captain Planet or are genuinely seriously injured or crippled, and this is for a kid's show in the 90s? That's some, that's some pretty hardcore shit. And they generally got away with it, too. Be thanks to the meddling kids. That's partially true. The Hanna-Barbera money helped a little bit later on. Uh, they originally got away with it because of their generally positive message. The way that TV ratings work, sort of, is like there's like a karmic scale. Um, if you're an environmentally friendly TV show, you can threaten to kill children. However, if you're a sitcom, you can't fart on camera. Kind of balances out, you know? Oh my god, that was just the first episode. Fuck. Um, alright. Everybody, please subscribe. But yeah, let's continue with this garbage. The episode that we're going to be covering today is Season 2, Episode 20, A Twist of Fate. Just out the gate, I know this isn't much 
to immediately start commenting on. This is literally the first scene of the episode. But I want to go ahead and address the big plot point of this entire episode. And that plot point is that for no reason whatsoever, Wheeler has decided that he hates poor people. Great. Nothing but unemployed people. Did you get anything? Yeah, I got the creeps. I never saw so many poor people. Why don't they get real jobs and get off the street? Like, oh my god, he's a Republican, you know? Like, what? You would be lost without me! And then he accidentally trips on the leg of this really maybe homeless man. We'd never really get an answer for who he is or what he stands for. But like, what what is with Wheeler in this episode? Like, what what happened between season one and season two? What trauma has occurred to Wheeler to to turn him into a into into this? I would like to go ahead and compliment the episode for what I can compliment it for. Basically everything from a production standpoint has improved tremendously from the previous episode. Bob, do you mind? But basically everything has improved from the previous episode. I of course don't mean the previous episode is in the last episode of the season, I mean the last episode that I watched, which looked like it had been animated in about a day and a half, and nobody really knew what they were doing. This one was at least more competently put together, and even the audio is mixed a little bit better, the voice actors seem like they're doing a slightly better job, and in general it just... They're doing a little bit better. I'm proud of them. The dick guys aren't doing so bad this go-round. And because he's mean to this particular person, Gaia decides to fuck with him. It's never directly stated that Gaia is the one who actually puts Wheeler through this, but she literally says the phrase, Except for a twist of fate, you might be in the shoes of that man you stumbled over. Ugh. And then immediately... Instantly, the moment she's done, there's an earthquake. And she's just like, oh, well, you know, it wasn't me. But also, there's an earthquake. Go check it out. You should go see what's going on. Nothing bad's gonna happen to you, Wheeler. No. After she says the phrase, were it not for a twist of fate, you might find yourself in his shoes. Do you even need to watch the rest of the episode? No. No, I didn't think so either. Just making sure, just making sure we were on the same page here. They arrive in a small farming village located in Santa Teresa, and when they do, they play their dime store Indiana Jones music. Oh. And begin helping people. Oh my, oh my god, she used her ring. Like, she actually used her magical power. Covered. They just didn't do that a lot of the time for some reason. Probably, like, budgeting reasons, like budget constraints, but... It was still noticeably like, use your magic powers. At least here they're doing it, you know? Gotta give them props for that one. They've grown as people. <laughs> in a similar vein, I'm incredibly proud of Kwame for actually doing something in this episode. I think when he said Earth just then, that was literally them taking his scene from Captain Planet, like when they're... Hey! Anybody in there? I better get back to the others. Within, I think, two minutes of them arriving on the scene of this earthquake, he's alive. Wheeler has been knocked out by a wall of bricks falling on top of him. He is then kidnapped by a Latino body, couple, and then, after both of those, he wakes up with amnesia and no memory recollection or anything of who he is or how he got there. He just knows he's Wheeler. What's your name? Um. Um. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. Have you seen Wheeler? No, Link, I have not. Not since the last aftershock. Let me try. Heart, I can sense nothing from Wheeler. Also, I didn't actually try, if we're being totally honest. He must be unconscious. Maybe he's trapped somewhere. We'd better look. As if they could just turn around and go back like a few hundred feet and take this boy that they found unconscious in a pile of bricks back the way they came we don't know and this boy, be like, hey, do you recognize this guy? He's wearing the same thing the you guys are. And they'd be like, oh yeah, that's that's Wheeler. But no, instead they take him miles away to see some doctor in a city where everyone's poor and suffering and starving. <laughs> I'm not blaming these people, by the way. They were going to the city in search of work and in search of a better life after the earthquake. They believed that the city was a sanctuary. However, this is all Gaia's doing. 
Guy is doing this to Wheeler right now. I just want to make that clear. That's all that I... That's that's it. That's all. Wind! Andy! But he must be here! He must be somewhere! How do they know to look there? Like, that's exactly where he was. That's 100% where he was. It's like Linka can smell him. Can you hear me? Wheeler! What? Who said that? He has pain and sickness. Biddle? Biddle? Wheeler! Who are you? What do you want? That one is delirious! Put the straight jacket on him! Oh my fucking god, they were locked and loaded with that thing, weren't they? Like, she pressed the button and they were like, straight jacket! Like, they waited for this moment. They've been sitting there in a dark room smoking cigarettes for 16 years, waiting for the time that the straight jacket button is pressed. This is, this is their, this is their moment. No thanks, guys! I don't wear white jackets! A bit too straight for me! A 2024 Captain Planet reboot would absolutely have somebody that was gay on there. They'd have a couple. Well, not like a couple, not like a gay couple. Well, there might be a gay couple. Really, they could all be a polycule. That'd be interesting. Good. I lost him. I'm lost too. Lost again, Wheeler? Who are you? I don't remember anything since I hit my head. What was it you called me? Wheeler. That is a bad wound. Like, I get that she's mad at him, but don't call the man ugly. He doesn't even have memories. He's just gonna trust you. He's gonna go through life thinking he's a- he's a- he's a plum now. <laughs> What's your name? Teresa? That's her butt. Her butt doesn't talk, Wheeler. Her mouth talks. At this point in the story, Wheeler has been taken to the city. Back where they were earlier at the beginning of the episode. He's mistaken for a crazy person gets away, and hangs out with this girl for a little while, while they walk around and Wait, steal things and do on. stuff and be street rats, essentially, for a bit. At last, we made enough money to eat. That is the most relatable thing I've ever heard in an episode of anything in a very long time. Aw, oh, come on, Wheeler, you learn how to make money and- Ooh! Give us your money! I really like this- quick like one to two second scene right here of the guy mugging her and her immediately handing him the money no questions asked so for one it's animated way better than most of the rest of the episode as well like they put a few extra dollars into this scene for some reason there's extra shading there's extra line work like it's a little choppy in a lot of places but it looks better but the interaction to me also tells kind of a story as well because teresa immediately drops every bit of money that she had into his hand without a second thought. And she does this in a way that implicates that she's been through this process before and would rather go ahead and pay this goon some cash than be stabbed or beaten or thrown into a ditch or ran over or clubbed. You get it. It was probably due to budget constraints that they had to cut the scene short, but I like to think it was a storytelling reason. Heart, the planeteers will return. Holy shit, did they kill Wheeler? You better back off, or you're gonna be playing with fire. Oh, let's get out of here, Bubbles. Run. Oh right, yeah, fuck Wheeler, you can do that. <laughs> Keep forgetting. Oh my god. Wheeler has used his ring. That way. Heart can do that. I wish you could get us some food. Offer that man your ring for some of his- Also, offer I didn't actually try if we're The magical totally fireball ring to the merchant for some fruit. Why is she arching like that, though? These fire traps ought to be condemned! <laughs> okay, so first of all, no. That's not how that works. Well, it would be if there was dry hay all the way around an indoor fire in a hot, arid area where tons of people lived and were tightly packed together. Yes, that would be how that worked. People don't do that. It's like being one of the three little pigs and building your house out of steak. You know, it's just asking for trouble. The whole neighborhood's going up! <gasps> A baby! Can we roll that back? A baby! The tenderness in his voice, like what? He's so genuinely, like, concerned. That's such a heartfelt delivery on there. Teresa! Are you alright? Wheeler! There's no way out! I can't get through! I'll get help! That needs help! 
She's trapped on that burning hillside! You! <laughs> hey! He's the firebug! How big is this city? How many people live in this city? How, how, how many individuals happen to be here? Because those are exactly the three people uh, that were quote-unquote wronged by, by these two. And one of which I want to point out was mugging them. <laughs> Like, they still got the money, too. Like, what? Get out of my head! Get out! Get out! He's loco and a pyromaniac! Get him! What raw, unfiltered action this show is. Why didn't he do that when he, they were getting mugged, by the way? Like, you'd think to protect somebody, you might judo throw a mugger. Amigo, how big is this city? No good. I will try to smother the fire with earth. Round. Heart. There's a bunch of dying children and animals, but we don't have to save them because they're not plot relevant. He would not need these shoes anymore, but I think they will fit our unlucky young friend. Except for a twist of fate. You might be in the shoes of that man you stumbled over. Oh, I'm in his shoes. That's the lesson. Thanks, Gaia. Remember now, I'm a planeteer. And Teresa, she's stuck in that fire. I've got to help. <gasps> Amigo, wait. You have several concussions. Andale, muchachos. Just for the record, by the way, they don't help. They disappear entirely as soon as this scene just, like, goes away. Like, we never see any of them again. I, I assume they burn to death in the fire. That poor girl does not have much time. Oh, Wheeler, where are you? Right behind you, beautiful. We gotta put out that fire and save the girl who saved my life. <laughs> Goodbye, Wheeler. Like, doesn't she have, like, a cat or something? Like, she's known Wheeler for a day. Like a day and an hour, if you count earlier in the episode. I get that she's supposed to have a sad life, but if Wheeler's the only bright point in it, I I I don't I don't firmly believe anybody could survive that kind of torment. It's time to let our powers combine. Earth. Fire! Wind! Water! Every time Captain Planet appears, I do a total 180 on my opinion of the show. Uh oh, she's in a real hot spot. Oh. Now to see about this fire, I think I see a way to beat the heat. I'm just gonna have to be this city's main man. It's a good one. It's, it's, it's a good one. <laughs> Captain Planet's a cool guy. I think you are making the right decision to go back to the land. Uh, we still have no doctor. If only we had someone like Teresa in our village. Well, why don't you ask her? Me? Go live with them? Yes. Our house is small, but you'll always have food to eat. And what about you people? We need a mechanic, a plumber, a teacher. Our village could support you all. I can't believe it. It's like a miracle. Don't ask me what's going on. I had amnesia, remember? I just want you to know, by the way, that moving to a small town away from the big city also doesn't work out every single time you do it. Also, the village was destroyed by an earthquake. Hog Tide. This episode centers around Gaia telling a story to the current Planeteers about another group of suspiciously similar-looking individuals with a 
similar set of powers and a similar you you get it they're the same characters just in the past these individuals in the past go against villains that are quite similar to a couple that we actually know of in the current timeline of captain planet these villains have a plan to create cheap housing on beachfront property which slowly erodes the land and causes a hurricane to destroy things but that's also their plan for some reason as well it's a really kind of weird episode there's a lot of things that don't make a whole lot of sense and it kind of feels like Gaia is just making things up sometimes, considering how forgetful she is at multiple points in the story. Like, she straight up forgets what happens to characters until reminded by the Planeteers. At a couple of different points, she's just like, no, I'm not gonna tell you that. I don't want to. Fucking, alright, why Why are you telling us this story thing? Please subscribe, I am almost at a thousand subscribers. I'm like at 961 at the time of recording this video. It's been a really, really good summer so far. I appreciate it tremendously. Thank you so much. And if you ever have any suggestions for content or any ideas for things that you want me to cover in the future, feel free to leave a comment down below. I'm trying to actually finish this series. My ADHD is telling me to go ahead and abandon it and do something else for a little while and then come back to it. But I want to actually do this and be done with it so I can... I can not have to return to Captain Planet. Anyway, yeah, let's start this trash. Man, what a storm! Plant life holds the sand in place. Natural vegetation is the best protection for coastal regions. But it is no protection against a bulldozer. <sighs> yeah, th th thanks, Kwame. I don't, I don't think I could have put that together without you there. Also, what is this garbage? Like, they're starting the episode with a Planeteer alert, sort of. Like, they've immediately begun doing the preachy stuff, which is normally reserved for the back end of the episode once everything is done. I guess they probably realized between seasons two and three that most people turned the show off during that like period or changed the channel and then came back to it when the theme song was going out. That's what I would have done. That's absolutely what I would have done as a kid. I would have flicked through some channels to something else and 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 watched literally anything else. You all know Rick's grandfather was Rex Rigger the first. I bought land cheap near this hotel to put in houses. Don Porkerloin. I'll pay anything if you can get me this permit. One of the things I gave praise to season two for is the improved voice actors. And with the exception of Rex here, who kind of sounds like he's doing a really bad impression of somebody whose name is escaping me currently right now, uh, Don Porkaloin himself is genuinely kind of menacing in this episode. Why such disrespect? You don't come here like a friend to congratulate me on my beach development or on becoming a grandfather. His lines are delivered well and he's got some gravitas to the things he says despite his fat, lumpy, stupid appearance. This is the villain in the main timeline, Hoggish Greedly, who currently Don Porcoloin has for some reason, like is never explained. I don't really know where his parents are or if Don Porcoloin ate them for Brecky Fast, but something happened to them and he currently owns Hoggish Greedly. Oh! Good, now someday I will ask you to do me a small favor in return, children and grandchildren. <laughs> Okay, sounds fair. <laughs> but like genuinely, he's kind of threatening though. Until he until he does like <laughs> like <laughs> I'm <sighs> Betty Blight. Don't tell me Betty Blight was the grandmother of Dr. Blight, right? As a matter of fact, yes. What? No way. How would you have guessed that? Was it just from the fact that everyone was there? This was the Smash Bros of Planeteer grandparents who have been working together for generations? We're just cleaning up your fucking mess? Is that right, Gaia? Fortunately, there were people even then who cared about the environment. And you remind me of one of them, Wheeler. You can be my honey, as long as you have money. Another one resembled you, Wenka. Excuse me, Mr. Commissioner. Don Porcoloin asked me to talk to you. <laughs> Her father's gone. Time to be a predator. So yes, these are the stand-ins for Wheeler and Linka for this particular period in time. And the thing you'll notice very quickly is that whoever's voicing Linka has not a single clue how to do this southern accent. Don't be long, Daddy. So I do not believe we have been properly introduced. Uh, well, as I said, one little dance can't hurt. Like, maybe it's worse for me because I'm from the South, 
But I, I don't think any human being has ever sounded like this ever, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person to think this. Also, they're in Florida. <laughs> they're just beachfront property, Florida. Who sounds like this there? I don't think these are period accurate. I don't think Captain Planet's period accurate, you know. That's one of its flaws. It's one of its many flaws. There was another young man who was a lot like you, Kwame. Oh, yeah, they say, see, there's Kwame. This is, I think, the episode where I feel it is implied the most the Planeteers have been cloned multiple times over multiple generations in order to defend the planet against pollution and evil through Gaia and uh, whoever else that they fucking work with sometimes. Who, uh, uh, is there anyone else? Captain Planet, that guy, the name of the show. <laughs> but genuinely, what are the odds that there happen to be five individuals of the same exact perfect physical description of the Planeteers? They're not... The parents of the Planeteers, by the way. Mati didn't even keep his same ethnicity. And Lee might not have either. We don't know, considering she's just from Asia. That's not Korea. That's not China. That's not Japan. It's not Taiwan. That's not Thailand. Asia. Mati, as a matter of fact, goes from Indian to Native American. Ah, good. Perhaps I convinced him to save our seacoast. Don't count on it. Don't be scared. My name's Asi. I'm Lee. Three characters. They wrote in the stand-ins for Wame, Wheeler, and Linka. And then they went, okay, well, uh... And they had nothing. They couldn't include them in anything else. They couldn't make them employees also. They had to just make them show up out of nowhere on the beach one day. <laughs> At least with Lee, she's here painting. There's a reason for her to be here. Mati's stand-in just shows up, and he's just like, I'm gonna fucking sue him! So I'm studying the white man's law to keep my people from losing any more land. Without plant life, our coast would look ridiculous, and we can't afford to look ridiculous. Daddy, thank goodness! It's time we went to our rooms, Lydia. And this is the South, so I guess you know how that's gonna go. I'm gonna beat you with a belt really, really bad. He declined the deal, boss. Well, you know what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wish I could have seen the commissioner's face when he woke up next to the state tree. Here's your zoning permit. What? 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 What am I missing? What's what happened? What's what's going on? The commissioner wakes up with a stick tree in his bed, and because of that, it terrifies him so badly that he screams, presumably for the rest of the night, and then immediately gives Don Porcoloin the the fucking permit. I don't understand how that makes any sense at all. Not only did the commissioner not know that it was Don Porcoloin who did that, but it's a stick tree. That's not scary. It's not a decapitated horse head. It's not the arm of a loved one. It's a it's a piece of wood with foliage. And how does that translate to giving the permit to Porcoloin? Okay, yeah. Whatever. It gets stupider from here. Okay, and all this beach will be washed away, and that will be the new shoreline. The one that's gonna hit tonight. I've seen a mini a hurricane, and that one gonna miss us. Who asked you? Get back to work. Well, good news, folks. Hurricane Deirdre has turned north and will miss us. Just love when God hates you. <laughs> Don't worry, Don, baby. I can change where that hurricane's headed. Just follow me. Ta-da! My moon manipulator. Okay, wait. Hold on. One moment. So, Betty Blight is here because she's just here. Like, she's just a singer here. But she also brought her weather manipulator devices and wasn't already working with him. It foretells the weather, raises the tide, changes the course of storms. Can I bring that hurricane ashore here? Like tonight? Piece of cake done, baby. And just agrees for no reason whatsoever to no benefit of herself to work with him and to destroy the coastline. This is the most chaotic evil I've seen a villain in a very long time in any source of media. She just shows up, has a weather manipulator, refuses to elaborate, and then leaves. There's never a motive. There's never a reason. She quite literally just does it. 
And maybe this is because Gaia herself doesn't actually know the motive behind why, so she skips over that part in the story. So treating it like that makes it almost bearable, but not quite. Also, it's called a moon manipulator, and the main thing it does is control the weather. Just wanted to point that out. Meanwhile, Don Porcoloin did some last-minute cleanup in his office. Get it? It's because he's fat. You worked it out the hotel this evening. How could you know? And you put up your building so cheaply, man. This hotel is doomed. So you're both fired. You miserable carpetbagger. No, no. Now, if you'll excuse me. I have the signatures of a thousand voters who do not want you ruining more coastland. And I'm also here! Weirdly, he has the most compelling piece of actual, like, this may fuck over Don Porcoloin on its own. And this is a subpoena to appear in court! But then Don Porcoloin is just racist and ignores him. No engine's ever gonna win on a white man's court. <laughs> You're in trouble now, Porcoloin! Why'd they all get behind him? Every one of them came up from the other direction, and they all ended up behind him. I get that he's a big guy, but they could stop him. They could gang up on him. There's five of them. Now you are. Ah! Keep calm, everyone. Do not lose heart! The Planeteers will return! And now, back to Captain Planet! Did the old-time Planeteers escape? And if they were Planeteers, did they have powers? Of course. Anyone has power if they work with others. He means power like our rings! Oh. Is Gaia okay? I'm just asking. She seems mostly fine, maybe a little forgetful. I just don't want anyone taking advantage of her. She seems like a nice lady, you know? Let us out of here, you scallywag! Colorful dialogue ain't gonna open the door, sweetheart. Neither will small Alec Remote. Oh my god, just shut up and fuck already. If you boys boost our seat to the transom, he could climb through- uh, No, I'm too big. But look, Porcaloin left the key. Would a coat hanger help? Oh, this is so mortifying. Using my bullshit hanger to unlock a door. Why'd she have that? Why'd she have a hanger? Is that something I'm missing about old-time southern, like, dressings? She wasn't even wearing anything that really looked like it would work. You know what? Maybe I'm just a boy and I don't know things about women. Possibility. This is, this is a firm one. We did it! Oh, we did it! it! What? Look! And my mind! Okay, so they're acting like they don't know what these rings are. Yet all five of them happen to have them. All five of them just now kind of respond to them as if they're seeing them for the first time. And none of them know what they are. How is that, considering they've been on them this entire time? If I woke up and a ring was on my finger that I did not recognize, I would be confused. But apparently, I'm in the minority here, because it's five against one on that. But what's this symbol on my ring mean? It looks like fire! Ah! And my symbol is... Marty! I don't know what my ring does. All it shows is three little old squiggly lines. My ring shows a glow. How on earth? Those kids worry me. Relax. I'll make them a deal they can't decline. Don Corcoloin's plan had worked. The old beach was gone, and what had been cheap inland property was now prime beachfront. But he had to put up his houses fast. So at this point in the episode, the Planeteers are now gathering people to sign petitions in order to stop Don Porcoloin from developing that beachfront. Because right now, Don Porcoloin wants to use it essentially as an insurance scam, building tons of cheap houses, taking presumably huge insurance policies, and then using storms to destroy them. At least that's what I think is happening. I really cannot tell. But with that kind of payout and that kind of money involved, that kind of risk, that level of corruption, if we've learned anything from the Boeing whistleblower controversies, Don Porcoloin would definitely be killing somebody right now. He'd be sending somebody after these Planeteers. Let's get more 
creatures. What? Sweet dreams. <laughs> Betty just pulled up on these dudes like she she ain't playing now and she's kind of rocking it right now. And also keep in mind her device literally moved a hurricane. Don Porcoloin was useless without her because the hurricane had moved off course. This is all Betty Blight. She's just using Don Porcoloin as a front to cause chaos. She is a demon. One of us has to meet Don Porcoloin at his new beach house. Come alone. Or your pals will sleep with the fishes. What I admire about you kids is you have your feet firmly planted on the ground. <laughs> they are surrounded by weak sand. This is weak sand. This is sand you could roll out of, scoot, something you could move if you really tried. Especially in a little bit when Kwame's mouth becomes av available for use again. <laughs> When Kwame gains the ability to talk again, and he doesn't say Earth once to break anything that he's done. Now I must leave you. I have a dinner guest. Lydia. You know all this is business. If you say so. Now you and that engine call off this petition. You, you big pompous bag of whales! <laughs> get it <laughs> i'm gonna crawl at you i'm gonna crawl real fast because i'm being fat i think he's dead i see this way here are your rings get a hammer our feet are set in concrete Boys, Betty Blight, turn on your moon manipulator. You got it, Don, baby. Okay, this is the 1940s. Who is this woman? Where did she get this? How did she build it? What? What is her purpose? She is a demon. I made that joke earlier because I was thinking, you know, it made a little bit of sense due to the level of chaos she was creating. But no, genuinely, that's the only explanation I can think of for why she's doing this and why she's helping him. Also, he just got up. Rex is still dead in the back, but Don Porcoloin just got up. He's fine. He's a big guy. What do we do? What would happen, Mom, if we let our powers combine? They just say that. Combined, I am Captain Planet! Go! Whoever you are! I just said my fucking name. Drown. Whoa. I've heard of heroes having feet of clay, but this is ridiculous. Thanks! But who are you? I'm your powers, Magnified. Haven't you heard the song? Captain Planet. It's kind of funny. I like when shows get meta. It's a weak point of mine. It doesn't always work, but whenever it comes out like this, or where it's only a specific character that can do it, it usually works really well. At least in terms of my particular sensibilities and humor. Captain Planet. No way, Ray. Ah! This is something new. I call it recycling. There you go, a nice paperweight. Just the thing to keep on your desk in prison. Why did he come preloaded with a shackle? He just crunched that up right there. He turned it into a ball. He didn't have a shackle. He just either immediately melted that into a shackle, which is now something Captain Planet can do, or he came preloaded with a shackle, which I don't think is one of the powers that has combined. So... Where did the shackle come from? Why does Captain Planet have a shackle? Why is he a freak? A certified freak. So yes, Captain Planet officially defeats Don Porcoloin and Rex, whatever the fuck his name is, and throws them at the feet of the police officers, revealing what they've done to them. So Don Porcoloin and Rex go to jail for a little while, then probably get out because Betty Blight just fell in love with his big sweaty body and has a weather manipulator well, or did before it was crumbled into a ball and shackle, but she'll get out. Like, how? Yeah, you're not going to keep the demon locked up. 
we had a quick cover on what happened to each of the old planeteers before they died, I guess, essentially. What their life could be summarized as in less than a sentence. A C-1 his tribe a huge settlement from the government for taking their lands. He was then immediately assassinated by the federal government. The planeteer alert for this episode is actually really bad, in my opinion. And I say that because not only are there two planeteer alerts at the end of the episode, meaning that there were a total of three environmental messages in this episode, but also the first planeteer alert, this one right here. Don't they see all that trash they are leaving behind? Has nothing to do with the episode. Being about littering and trash being left on the beach. Not about erosion or any of the things that the episode was about. I understand that they're just tying it to it being a beach. Please do not waste energy. <laughs> Please don't waste your minds and bodies. Please don't waste our future. Fuck you, I'll waste our future if I want to. It's my future too. And I'm having fun? It's really fun seeing how bad the show is, but at the same time having to sit down and actually watch it kind of reduces my enjoyment a little bit. Quick aside, I want to apologize. I, I said Mati was from India before. Uh, he's from South America. So, uh, yeah, that's my bad. Luckily, we're on part four, meaning the majority of it's out of the way. But that still means I have to sit through the Hanna-Barbera seasons. Our world is in peril. Gaia, the spirit The now defunct no company known as Hanna Barbera was founded by the Tom and Jerry creators, uh, something Hanna, something Barbera. I don't remember their first names. But the production company was incredibly successful for the time, being able to produce cartoons with speed and precision that wasn't really seen in a lot of other production companies at the time. Hanna Barbera was known for the quickness at which they could produce the cartoons that they aired. Part of this was due to them saving time through various means, whether that's looping animation or having pre-painted backdrops, which sometimes, and generally actually, look better than most of the show around them. But between seasons three and season four, the production comp- the produ- <clears throat> Between season three and season four of Captain Planet, the production company swapped from Dick Entertainment, who are the most unfortunately named production company I've ever known of in my entire life, to Hanna-Barbera. Not really sure why, not really sure what happened there, I just know it happened. <sighs> And this probably is not the best episode to watch as my first introduction to the Hanna-Barbera seasons. That episode is You Bet Your Planet. A quick rundown of the episode before we really dive into it, because the plot's confusing and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and I probably won't really be able to talk about it through all the insane nonsense that happens throughout the episode. But essentially, planeteers find themselves in a cave. For no known reason, we don't know anything, Gaia won't talk to them for some reason, their rings aren't working, and also Captain Planet is not responding. Then they immediately find themselves on an alien game show with all of their worst villains gathered together at a table, fighting for the fate of the world because it is so polluted. They win, of course, being the good guys, but they don't deserve it, they don't earn the win, and it's really convoluted and really dumb. The entire plot of the episode happens in the first two minutes, like... All of it is dumped out right there, and then they just, they're just playing the game show for the rest of the episode. We never really get a firm explanation as to why they're there. We never get an explanation as to how the aliens <laughs> which is something they did. <clears throat> we never learn where Gaia is or what happened to her. Her voice isn't even in this episode, because I assume they couldn't pay Whoopi Goldberg enough to show back up and reprise her role for this season. Either that or Whoopi Goldberg just didn't want anything to do with it. If you like this video, please subscribe. If you don't like this video, please also subscribe, but tell me why you don't like the video in the comments below. Give me 35 comments on why I'm a garbage human being, and I may, uh, I don't know, cry? <laughs> So before the episode even begins, I want to point out that the episode's intro, its title crawl, its opening narration has been redubbed by... I didn't look up the voice credit for the narrator before this episode. I gotta admit, I kinda like the old guy better. None of this makes any sense. I just wish we knew what happened to Captain Planet. Oh my god, they look like crap. <laughs> like... Okay, they don't look terrible, but the Wikipedia article for this season specifically states that there is a noticeable improvement in animation quality between seasons three and four, and I disagree with every fiber of my being. And it's immediately apparent, too, because just looking at the Planeteers, every single one of them has the same walk, the same body type, the same everything about them other than their faces and skin colors. Everything's the same. They also move in the same way that a lot of other Hanna-Barbera characters do, like this, I guess. I guess that's what that is. 
But yes, we cold open with them with no powers, with no idea why they're here, with no access to Captain Planet. This, to me, shows that Hanna-Barbera has absolutely not a single goddamn idea what they're doing with this property. Because it was my belief that the rings got their power from Gaia, which then, together, could create and summon Captain Planet. However, now... Their powers are directly tied to Captain Planet, and without him, their powers are useless. Meaning that they are not their powers. They are Captain Planet's powers, which is not how that works. Yeah, he's been gone over a week and I kind of feel naked without my firepower. If you know what I mean. I... <laughs> We're gonna let it slide. What the... What is going on? What the fuck is this? <laughs> Like, okay, I know aliens are already, like, a canon thing in Captain Planet. They've been in a couple of episodes before this one. But usually, one alien is the focus of the entire episode. This one just drops 3,000 different alien species, the implication of an entire galactic empire spanning the entire galaxy, powers beyond our wildest reckoning, and they do it to host a shitty game show. <laughs> And to just start the episode this way with a giant floating mouth next to a big beepy computer machine and hordes of aliens just sitting in the stands, I am concerned. I'm, I'm concerned immediately. That said, I do like this guy. Lexo! He's a funny little dude. He's a lot of fun. He's, he's real entertaining. Casey Kasem is this guy for some reason. I guess he was still being paid big money by Hanna-Barbera just to show up whenever they needed him to. But I immediately recognize the man. Like, once you've watched Scooby-Doo Where Are You enough times, you really start to recognize Mr. Kasem. Thank you, Barf! I can't remember when I've seen an earthier-looking bunch! <laughs> Can you, audience? He was a radio DJ. That's a job that people, like, got famous for. Do people still get famous for being radio DJs? I really don't know. I don't think they do. Now you gotta have a podcast. They are at an alien game show where the fate of the entire planet is now at stake against the returning champs. These guys. You bet your planet! Are your returning champions ready? <laughs> what are they doing here? Now, I think the intention behind calling them the returning champs has to do with the fact that the Earth is already the most polluted planet in the galaxy, according to this guy right here. So technically, they've already won. However, these are literal, actual people playing a literal, actual game show that they've never been on before, so they are not returning champions. They are a bunch of tools! I'm sure you're all familiar with our show. We're numero uno in the galaxy! See, it's funny because he's fat. We've decided that the situation on your planet has reached a critical point. If the eco-villains win, they'll be free to trash the planet! Who is in charge of running this game show? And who gives them the power and the ability to allow the evil villains, the bad guys, the, the, the baddie brigade right here, these five bitches, who allows them to trash the planet on their victory? Who's to say that Gaia in her all-powerful magical bullshit, doesn't just, like, cause an earthquake or something. Tsunami, she burned a city down to teach Wheeler a lesson. She can handle a couple of aliens. But it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it, because we're immediately on to my next problem with the episode. Well, Lexo, the answer is behind curtain number one. How'd they get Captain Planet? Much like everything else in this episode, we never get an explanation for it. But I would like to point out the fact that Captain Planet is not supposed to be a solid entity for more than a few minutes at a goddamn time. He's supposed to exist within the rings of the Planeteers, and they combine their powers to create him for a brief period so they can have their problems solved. Instead, here, he's captured and useless for the entirety of of the episode. He does nothing. They do not combine their powers, because apparently their powers have already been combined. With no explanation, mind you. Not one! Let's talk about something else. Wheeler and Linka are the main characters now, by the way. Nobody else has any semblance of personality left from the previous seasons. Kwame has been reduced from the leader to just some guy that sits in the background who walks in front of the rest of the group sometimes. Like, that's all he does. Mati barely even speaks anymore. I don't know if this had to do with budget reasons. I don't know if this had to do with the fact that Mati was the least popular character. 
I don't know. But the fact is that Mati barely even exists. And the same can be said for G. Gi? And the same can be said for Gi as well, with water literally being her only personality trait in this entire episode. So the aliens have Captain Planet, so now the Planeteers have to compete in this stupid game show in order to free him and keep him from coming to harm. Even though, even if he dies, I assume he just returns to the ring. It's, it's whatever, you know? Let's just let the episode continue if we keep poking holes in it. It's, there's not gonna be much left. So in the very first game, Kwame and Plunder are pitted against each other in a trivia knowledge match. Go for it, Kwame! All right, Planeteers, here goes! Ah! The question being, when was the most recent nuclear accident? Period. That's it. That's all we get. Kwame, of course being the nuclear physicist that he is, immediately knows the answer to that question and gets it right. And then this happens. Plunder, you pile of bile! That's the latest nuclear accident. <laughs> Looks like the eco villains take an early lead. I mean, that is cheating, right? Like, that's blatant, obvious, just like, we don't want you to win cheating. Granted, you know, at some point in the episode, it, Mr. Kasem does say this. For us, this isn't about good or evil. It's about ratings, baby. So I can forgive kind of the silliness of the game show to an extent, because they do just kind of care about the ratings. It's very accurate for TV. Wait, what? The for Captain Planet to eat today, It's a toxic taste treat! Raw sewage with a dump. This is a weirdly horny episode. And I don't just mean because of this scene. This There's a lot of weird things with Captain Planet in it, just scattered throughout this episode. But that one joke with Wheeler from earlier was indicative of much more to come. I assume this was done in an attempt to appeal to the parents of the kids that were watching the show, because it was probably a really boring show to have on in the background, especially if your kid really liked it. Also, I'd like to point out Captain Planet's gotten a lot stronger since season one. Like, I know he's captured, tied up, gagged, and being force-fed in this particular scene, but in the first season he was sprayed lightly with some polluted goop. And he had to go and rest for a few minutes and, like, come back later. Here, they're force-feeding him toxic sludge, and he's just like, Bleh. Bleh. I don't like it. Bleh. And that's it. That's all you get. He's not, like, really suffering. <laughs> I want him to bleed. Hey, that looks pretty good. You get it? Because he's fat. He doesn't even eat it. He just tears a piece, and it just pops back into place. I don't even think he chews. So, of course, through the power of cheating, the villains beat the Planeteers at this particular game. Meaning Captain Planet got force-fed, and we get a word from our sponsors. This is the best part of the episode, by the way. It just has kind of a fun vibe to it. Still doesn't fit with the vibe of Captain Planet, but as its own standalone segment, I can dig it, I can feel with it, I can vibe it. Free installation in an hour! The aliens are furious with us for polluting our planet. They treat us like dirt for treating our planet like dirt. But in doing so... They actively side with the villains because instead of using their vast amounts of technology and their crazy, crazy power level that they have to, you know, enslave Captain Planet, teleport all the Planeteers, get all the villains, make them all work together and not kill each other. Despite that, they've determined it will be easier and more fun to instead destroy the entire planet. Admittedly, if the planet really was the most polluted in the entire galaxy, I feel like I could probably understand it, but considering later on there are ads for more polluted planets and people moving from them to new planets, I don't think it's the most polluted in the galaxy, guys. I think you might be over-exaggerating just a little bit here. So there's several seconds of pointless bickering between the Planeteers as they try to figure out who's going to go against Hoggish Greedly in the next fight. They run out of time, and Linka is chosen for them, who is given an air pack in place of her ring. Let me guess, it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. But the game here in question is to prevent Hoggish Greedly from polluting the area and reaching the brown button. Linka's goal is to reach the red button and press it before he presses the brown button, while simultaneously preventing him from polluting the entirety of the water. Don't really know what's to stop either of them from just beelining it directly to the button considering the game ends immediately upon pressing it, but neither of them do it, instead opting to play the game. Oh, and the air pack just starts working again, of course, duh. This is a stupid game. It's a stupid game. It's... 
So the point of that game is to prove that it is easier to create a mess than it is to clean that mess up. And yeah, that's true, you're not wrong about that, but at the exact same time, like, wasn't this show supposed to make kids want to help the environment and want to do things to clean things up? If they really believe that cleaning the environment is going to be more difficult than harming the environment, a lot of people aren't going to do it. Like, I hate to say it like that, but people are lazy, I'm one of them. If I think something's hard, I'm going to try to avoid it. And here, it really makes it seem hopeless. Like, it makes it seem like everything they've done up until this point has not mattered in the slightest. And that's just because it's easier to pollute than it is to clean. Not because of shitty mega corporations ruining our economy because they want to make a quick buck or nothing like that. That'd be crazy. Uh, but it just goes to show it's easier to mess it up than to clean it up. <laughs> it can't take much more. <laughs> Am I the problem? I feel like I'm anticipating more sex jokes than there actually are, and that's making me see them where they're not. So we're gonna scoop by this one too, but this feels... this feels gratuitous. There are many parts of me you do not know, Yankee. <gasps> okay, yeah, no, it's definitely hornier. There... <sighs> if there's one thing I didn't need in my Captain Planet and the Planeteers, it's teenagers really trying not to dry hump in front of everybody in the audience. Banana has a special wrist-mounted flamethrower for Wheeler to simulate his firepower. What about my heart power? You can have my- <laughs> Yeah, the alien just like rips his heart out and tries to give it to Mati, and that's that's okay, that's acceptable. We can show that on TV, uh, because it's a fake heart, supposedly. Never mind that he just ripped it out of his chest and is still beating, but- it's a fake heart, just trust us on this one. Versus Wheeler. So in this game, we have a relay race with Wheeler and Mati versus Hoggish Greedley and Maul. Who, it, uh, weirdly, is voiced by Tim Curry. Why are you here, Tim? You can do better than this, Timothy. You can do better. In order to win, they have to make it to the end of the racetrack, circle a pole, return, give the baton to their partner, who then have to do the same thing, all while avoiding obstacles that are themed around either pollution or just something that harms the environment slash the planet in general. For instance, in the first moment, Maul gets a forest that he burns down with a laser. Interesting. Fits him, I think, maybe. Who knows? Wheeler gets an exploding semi-truck. <laughs> and the truck is presumably like a fuel truck, like one carrying gasoline. And then Wheeler, in all his intelligence and in all of his Big brain boy energy uses fire to seal the hole that the gas is coming out of and somehow doesn't explode and die. <laughs> but Wheeler is just behind whenever the baton is passed from Maul to Hoggish Greedly and then Wheeler passes the baton to Mati, who says nothing, by the way. He says very little while he's running and then gets hit by a trout. He's gonna eat that. Le okay, no, um, no, he's gonna eat that now. Also, I just wanna point this out. I noticed this while I was watching the episode. At this point, right here, they are almost at the pole that they have to circle, right? They're right there. You see it too. 30 seconds of animation happens between this point and Hoggish Greedly making it to the end of the relay section. 30 seconds with obstacles and everything in their way that just come out of nowhere because there's no space left at the end of the track. Did they even try? <laughs> Hell yeah, Monty. You go you, man. I mean, you run like an idiot, but that was cool. I can't do that. I'm sorry. It's not your fault, little buddy. Something that bothers me in this episode is not just that Monty has not been a character here, because other than Wheeler and Linka, there aren't any characters in the Planeteers anymore. But Mati, specifically, is treated really strangely. It's almost like the other Planeteers treat Mati as if he's their friend who left their helmet at home today. You know, like, he's their special little buddy, and he's only there as a favor to, like, his mom or something. But if you have this character who's going to be actively doing things and actively being a part of the story, I feel like not only should you give him more agency, but you should also give him personality. And respect. And he doesn't get any of that. Best ways for Earthlings to deal with environmental problems. Look, it's Gaia. Huh? Why did that work? Why did that work? Why? Gee, girl. 
He doesn't even change the image on the face of his computer as far as we're aware. He literally, this computer, this this piece of shit computer, this crap box, floats his little head over there on its tendril, pokes it in front of Guy, and goes, hey look, it's Gaia, and she goes, really? No! No, you're not that stupid. You're not that dumb. And then the fact that there is like a solid three seconds from the time that the question is asked to the time that his head actually reaches her that she could have hit the button. Also, Dr. Blight's an idiot. So, Dr. Blight, name one of the five best ways for Earthlings to deal with pollution. Make more, of course. Sorry! Mm, Yeah, my doctorate's in philosophy, actually. What does it mean to deal with pollution? Are we forming a valuable trade deal with pollution? Or are we getting rid of pollution? What is the real... So the Planeteers are now in a sudden death match. And in this game, none of the other games before mattered. Because if you win this game, you win the whole game. Regardless of your points, regardless of the scores, regardless of the number of questions you get right, if you win this game... You win the game. The whole game. I don't know the rules. I don't know why this makes sense in this universe. I don't know if it does make sense in this universe. But it's the rules they operate on, and we have to accept them, unfortunately. The Planeteers managed to get four of the five top answers right, family feud style, of course, before not knowing what the first answer is. The villains are then required to create an answer that involves saving the planet versus destroying it, something that they have a very hard time grasping, but do eventually get around to, you know, putting together and doing. They guess a bad answer, despite the fact that Maul, the computer, gave them the right answer, and they chose to not go with it because they're all morons. The answer must be, move to another planet. Like, if I could Google an answer versus just taking Bob on his word, I'm gonna Google it every single time, but instead these shit kebabs are just deciding, oh no, he's not the smartest of all of us by far. He's not using logic and facts and reasons. We don't like this guy. That's all we need. Wow, look at Mati getting literally Mike Wazowski'd over there. (laughs) Poor guy. At this point, because of the fact that the Planeteers have won the game, Cap has been freed from his restraints. Now, up until this point, I assumed that Cap was being held literally in his corporeal form through some weird alien technology. That was my excuse. But at this point, once Cap is freed, not only do the Planeteers still not get their powers back, but Cap stays as a solid human being so he can be attacked by Duke Nukem. Cap, what? Why'd she do that? <laughs> like, what was the point? That doesn't even do anything. Like, Wheeler blows up some lights and they get teleported away in a second. Like, did you need to do that? <laughs> Pleading the game show and freeing Captain Planet... All of the Planeteers wake up in their beds the next morning, having all had the same crazy nightmare. I just had the weirdest nightmare. Yeah, and you kissed me. Uh, definitely a nightmare. And none of them are sure if it was real or not, except for the fact that it absolutely was, because it goes and shows the villains all sitting in the game showroom still, proving that the episode actually happened and is actually just as stupid as... You know, it could have been. If it was a dream, at least I could excuse some of the wackier elements, especially if it was one of the Planeteers' dreams. But it wasn't. It really happened. And that's it. That's the end of the episode. Yes, really, we don't see Cap do anything other than get tortured and force-fed throughout this entire episode. And the Planeteer alerts are also really bad as well. (laughs) I'm eating my own words after the first episode of this, where I said that the Planeteer alerts were the best part. Because initially, they were. But in this case, they have nothing to do with the episode whatsoever. Uh, The first one being very loosely tied to it being about recycling. Um, And the second Planeteer alert, which happens after the credits, it's just about pesticide. You might hear my son playing Fortnite in the background. If you do, just know that he's very excited and having a great time. But welcome back. Welcome part to my... Remember to subscribe. I would appreciate it tremendously. I just broke a thousand recently. Thank you guys so much. Let's jump into this crap. We're going to be covering Season 5, Episode 13. Who's running the show? This clown right here has a pretty big part in this story because he's the eco clown and he's here to teach kids to help the environment, but he's a stupid bumbling clown. And don't get me wrong, the Planeteers love it. Like, the Planeteers are big fans of this guy. They're like laughing their butts off right there in the front row watching the television in Gaia's house, which at this point I assume that they've killed Gaia and buried her under a flower bed or something because she's nowhere to be 
seen. Ask your parents to install water-conserving shower heads there. I guess they all just hang out now. Like, they have, like, a lair. And this is odd to me, mostly because in the previous episode they did not like each other whatsoever. Also, who's- who's that? I haven't seen him yet. Like, ever. Enough clowning around! It's time to kick off Operation Sweeps Week! And sweep the week right off the air! Did she not complete that sentence? Like, sweep feet right off... The air. She's saying the air. Oh my god, that just struck me now. The way she delivers that line, it comes off as there. So, woo. I kicked my tripod. Oh my goodness. Ten city blocks of tropical forest being cut down every minute? Nuclear waste being dumped today will remain poisonous for more than 10,000 years? Ted Turner listing the environmental facts and freaking out about them, which is his justification for creating this show to begin with. This entire episode is this. It is Ted Turner justifying Captain Planet and the Planeteers as something that needs to be on television. And it doesn't work. It does not make me want environmental television more. It doesn't. Sorry, Ted. I just, I hate that for you, but I, I can't help what is good and what isn't. Like, I appreciate the message. I appreciate the sincerity behind it and the genuine, like, concern he shows for the environment in this episode. But that's the only highlight. That's the only good thing. Everything else is stupid as hell. Most of them, I mean, I, I kind of get being concerned about them. And then we get to this one. World population to nearly double over the next 50 years? You know what the future is, my boy? Which to me carries the implication that Captain Planet supports eugenics. Or at least Ted Turner does, which, you know, possible. He is crazy. He's a crazy old billionaire. Uh, so wouldn't really shock me. And but but whatever, let's move on. No! The coalition of villains formerly known as these guys have broken into the TBS headquarters or whatever the TBS stand-in is at this. They've removed Silly Clown Man off of the air, which the Planeteers were enjoying tremendously, by the way. But on taking over the air, they begin to implement more violent or more awful programming in general, just promoting products that completely destroy the environment and completely promote violence and danger and terror and awful things. That's what this episode is about, by the way. It is the danger of television, which keep in mind that they have to cover their ass for this later on in one of the Planeteer alerts as well, because this is a television show. <laughs> Granted, it's trying to suck its own dick. It really is. It's going, it's like, you know, on its back, legs up, but it can't quite reach it. Mostly because the show's bad and everyone knows it's bad and we're just kind of watching a train wreck at this point. <laughs> you get it? because he's fat. Somebody put a sock in these suits! Why do you do that? Why do you wiggle them? Like, is there a camera? Well, there might be. They might be airing this, actually, now that I think about it. Like, you know what? That's fair. I can accept this. Also, I'm gonna just name this guy, because I, there's, I see he's got rats, and I see he looks kind of like a rat. I'm gonna call him Rat Man. You know, actually, I think they're, is there a character called Rat King in this show? I know there is in, in Ninja Turtles, but I don't remember if there is in this show or not. I'm gonna call him Rat King, and I'm gonna hope I'm right. I think I am. I think I'm right. The Kilowatt Clan. You're really gonna charge watching them enjoy life out of the power line. Yes, a real planeteer only uses oil lamps and hand crunk machines. If you use the power grid. You're an evil bastard. I hope you realize that. I hope you know that. Planeteers, not being a very big fan of this type of programming, have decided to take it upon themselves to take out the eco-villains at the whatever the TBS headquarters name is actually supposed to be. And it takes them a while to get there. And that's probably because the Planeteers are based on some remote island in the middle of nowhere. And the eco-villains are in the center of somewhere, like a big populated area, you'd think the Planeteers at this point would at least move a little closer, you know? It's been five seasons, you'd think they'd be smarter than that, but they do have to continue to hide Guy's body, so. To your parents into buying you Soldier Sam and the Sadistic Slammers. I mean, I gotta be honest, I would buy it. I know it wouldn't actually blow things up like it shows in the advertisement, but I mean, it's he's cool, look at him, he's a big guy, he's got a lot of guns, a lot of attachments, looks like he's high quality. They don't make toys like this anymore. Well, they do, they're just 
$80. Lethal radiator fluid! Until <laughs> next time, kiddies! Think toxic thoughts! Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, Captain Planet just killed a dog live on air, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's a cartoon dog, but... Which, you know, has a message. I understand it as an adult, but as a child? Don't, don't think this would do much for me. I think this would make me change the channel. Probably not. I was a weird kid. Something must be very wrong at Learner Communications. Learner Communications, that's what it's called. Also, uh, just, just to point out, if you use electricity, you're a bad person. Learner Communications here, they could, they, none of, none of this is environmentally harmful. Don't worry about that. Don't, details, details. Three. Check it! Check it! Check it! Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You get it. Because he's fat. I'm so sick of this joke. That this is the this is this character. This is all he is, is one big long fat joke. Every time you see him, that is the only personality trait he displays is fat. <laughs> so let's introduce you to the real villain of this episode, and that is Duke Nukem. Nukolo, the planet destroyer! We'll rip him apart! Now Dookie here takes things to an extreme later on in the episode that's kind of foreshadowed right here. Granted, you could say it's Dr. Blight's influence kind of egging him on. He's just having fun with it, you know? He's just getting in character. He's just having a good time, WrestleMania style. Uh, well, it, uh, until the chainsaw. Help! 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 Stand still, twerp! Oh, also, just for the record, I didn't mention this guy earlier. He's Ted Turner's assistant. Uh, who he refers to as boy, despite clearly being like 45. So the Planeteers arrive, and they stop Duke Nukem from killing this poor fool. In doing so, they agitate Mr. Nukem, and he starts blasting them. But his aim is terrible, though, so it's completely okay. Something that they literally comment on. So, can't blame him. Watch out! That's still egoic! That's the first showcase of the Ring of Power being used in this episode. The Ring of Power, the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> this is the first showcase we get of the Ring's powers in this episode, and it's just it's like a, it's, a, it's a lump. Why not create a wall that they can't bypass? No, just create a lump and trip them. That's that's all we need, Kwame. Thank you, thank you for that. I appreciate it. You ever hear a target practice? <laughs> Yeah. I don't know, throw a, throw a candy bar in, in any general direction and he will be distracted. Just do it. Why don't they carry food for just such an occasion? Like, they know, they know it's his weak point. They know he will be distracted by it. Why don't they, why don't they bring it? Plan for your enemies, guys. Like, there is nowhere to go but up. Oh. Much better. Much better job, Kwame. I... Phenomenal, thank you. So the Planeteers manage to escape to the roof, and upon doing so, the water tower is blasted by, uh, by old Duke Nukem here, somehow. Like, it ricochets despite never ricocheting ever again, and not ricocheting ever prior, and blasts a hole in the water tower, washing the Planeteers almost off of the roof, despite the fact that they have time to summon Captain Planet. You know, whatever, this is a crisis for them. I understand wanting to, to summon Cap here, um. But doesn't one of their magic rings control water or something? Possibly? Use it. Anyway, here's Captain Planet. By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet. Also, weirdly, Cap makes a lot of, uh, pop culture references in this episode like he they're kind of doing like a robin williams jim carrey thing with him i think it's just because this is an episode about television and they're just referencing television a lot cap briefly does battle with the eco villains and in doing so he wears out duke nukem despite dookie blasting like crazy before now this is just a bit too much for him but then he's hit with his one weakness goop he's gooped every single time that he comes on screen, except in the one episode where he shows up in the past. Hog Tide, that one, that, that's the one. Every other time he gets covered in some kind of goop, and I, I don't know why. But th th that's his weakness, I guess that's probably why, actually, because he immediately goes back into the Rings of Power. Yours must recharge! <laughs> the power is yours! Which, again, kind of makes me infuriated at the last episode even more. 
Go watch that if you haven't, by the way. It's really dumb. It's way stupider than this one, I promise. So despite still having power in their rings, power that is used later, they then choose to run. I mean, I do understand it. Duke Nukem specifically is kind of a threat. He's the only real credible threat amongst them, actually. Being able to blast nuclear radiation out of his hands while everybody else is just fat, rat, and woman. <laughs> Those are the other villains. We have, we have one competent member. He's our powerhouse. Everyone else is just here for the clout. As part of their plan, they're going to blow the studio up once they're done airing their violent or awful programming. And genuinely, Dr. Blight is the only one making plans in this scenario. Hoggish is just a grunt. Rat King is also just a grunt. It's a good thing they didn't have henchmen in the animation budget this episode, you know? It sounds like it is coming from the closet. Careful, little buddy. Eagle the Clown? I can't believe those creeps would do this to a great actor like you! Who is this guy? I feel like this is another self-insert character along with Ted Turner. This is somebody else who uh, is significant in the studio, but I don't know who he is. I don't know who he's supposed to be, and I don't know who he's supposed to represent. All I know is he's a stupid eco-clown. Thanks. I was slamming my nose against the wall for hours. We need your help. I'm your clown. Ta-da! We're referencing a much more successful cartoon. Who are you guys? I, we're uh, the Filth Stones. Oh, okay. Break a leg. I like that Dookie is very friendly to the people that are on his side, though. Like, he's a knight. He's a, he's just a simple lad. Like, I kind of like him. He's just having a good time. He's just here for the, for the lulls, man. He, he doesn't know what's going on, but he, he's into it. He's, he's a method actor. Which is the problem. Because their goal here is to destroy the studio. That is what they're doing in this particular footage, in this video that they are filming. This film that they're filming. And Dookie, being the method actor that he is, brings a nuke. I don't know why anyone's surprised, I don't know why anyone's shocked, but Dr. Blight quickly talks him down from it and replaces the nuke with a smaller, more manageable missile. Props to her, she doesn't want to die. Planeteers arrive just in time to stop them from executing the worst parts of their plan, namely the explosion. N and <sighs> this is why I have problems with the Planeteers not using their rings in more scenarios than they do, because Linka uses wind, which blows both Duke Nukem and Dr. Blight back against these vehicles right here, right? One of them's a tank. Now, of course, I immediately assume that these are fake, like these are props or something like that, but then Rat King hops inside of one of them and uses it like a tank, meaning that these were actual real vehicles, real tanks, real steel, and that's how hard she blew them away with her wind. That is nuts that's like that's use that more if all of the rings are that capable of that level of power they shouldn't even ever have to summon captain planet but that's what they do anyway because they're lazy as hell i am captain planet score one for the gipper and score two for the nuker See, Dookie just manages to land his attacks when they count, that's all. He's like Shaq throwing free throws, like he can't actually do it, but every once in a while he scores a good one. What's up, kid? Cap manages to stop Duke Nukem by freezing the tower that he's standing on with the nuke. Dookie thankfully narrates for us, so we know what's happening. It's frozen to my head! I'm frozen too! And of course, being the jobbers that the rest of them are, they're caught immediately, and the episode has to wrap up very, 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 very quickly. So, uh, let's go. The power is yours! We're not paying these kids, right? So the Planeteer Alert here is actually a pretty good one as a standalone Planeteer Alert. Without this episode as context for it, it actually has a good message, stating that you need to be informed in order to make educated decisions, in order to know the problems that are plaguing our, our world and our economy and everything else. But within the context of this episode, there's one particular line that really shows that they're just trying to cover their ass. Television is also a great way to learn about other cultures so we can understand each other better. Read, watch the news. It could have been more gratuitous. It could have been more just like, except for our channel and many eco-friendly TV show. But they didn't do that, and I do appreciate that. But that was the entire theme of the episode. This one's also loosely tied to it as well, not being terrible, again, uh, other than Gaia just standing there and staring at the camera menacingly. <laughs> but she's like stiff, she's like a corpse, she says nothing, she's just there. Before the episode even begins, by the way, we gotta talk about this. 
Captain Planet. He's the man, leading the Chargers' number one fan. Yeah, he can use a better groomer. Some people say he's got a bad sense of humor. The opening narration has been completely replaced with whatever kind of theme song you want to call this, with the alien mouth from, uh... You Bet Your Planet. Singing, for some reason? I don't know if that mouth ever came back either. I think they're just reusing the assets from that episode. I would so much rather have the opening narration. That was just boring. This is atrocious. You don't, you just coming in here for a second? I kept on hearing your voice repeating. Yeah, because I kept messing up saying certain things and trying again. Because you gotta, whenever I edit, I, I take out the ones that I do bad on and put in the ones that I say I do good on. Now, the episode Who Gives a Hoot is considered one of the worst episodes in all of Captain Planet's history, being the reason a lot of fans apparently quit watching the show entirely and gave up on it completely. That's exactly the reason we're not covering it today. A lot of people have already talked about this episode, uh, a lot for Captain Planet at least, like there's a few if you look about it online, but they're better with their words than I am. I'm just doing this because I want attention. So I decided instead to cover another episode that was just as bad, but didn't receive quite as much hate, and that episode... It's Frog Day Afternoon. So in our first scene, we're introduced to the villains of this episode, Dr. Blight and Mal, who are in a ship just hanging out for some reason, doing a medical exam on Dr. Blight. Now, whatever's wrong with her is wrong with her head. You're in perfect health. From the neck down, that is. But they're scanning the rest of her body anyway for some reason. Don't really know what that's about. I think Mal's just screwing with her because, uh, as we find out later, he's not really on her side. But Mal informs Dr. Blight that her scar that she keeps covered by her hair has begun to spread. And within a year, it will cover her entire body, making her a monster of living scab tissue and scarification. Kumo. No ma'am. She, of course, freaks out about this and starts assaulting Mal, who cares despite being a digitized consciousness within a computer, but whatever. And he comes up with a harebrained idea, harebrained even by his estimation, to essentially combine Dr. Blight's DNA with frogs, which will cause it to regenerate her scar tissue. Many amphibians can regrow lost limbs by repairing their genetic material, or DNA. Apply this phenomenon to your DNA structure, and theoretically... Will it work? It could, but it probably won't. That doesn't sound like a very good plan. Dr. Blight loves it, though. Like, jumps on board immediately and starts taking whole islands with ecosystems containing frogs so she can keep them in a little frog prison. She could just build a terrarium. But instead, she takes islands. Which is, of course, why she gets caught. Just wear sunblock or you will barbecue your skin. Don't worry, your pretty little moisturized. We arrive on Gaia's Island where the Planeteers are having a fun game of beach volleyball. Wheeler, being Wheeler, isn't wearing sunscreen. What a card. What a, what a silly little goober he's being. And definitely not Gaia shows up to tell them of the frog habitats that are disappearing. Exactly. And in recent years, amphibians around the world have been dying off. Oh, Samoy. I say definitely not Gaia, because Gaia's voice actor was completely replaced at the end of season 3. They lost Whoopi Goldberg and instead replaced her with Margot Kidder. I haven't heard her voice at all come out of Gaia's mouth until season 6, so I think they just finally wrote Gaia back into the show in season 6, or this is just a doppelganger that the Planeteers have created to hide the fact that Whoopi Goldberg guy is still dead in the flower bed. But the Planeteers being the Planeteers hear about these frog environments disappearing and they decide to jump on it right after they lay out some quick frog facts. Frogs have existed on Earth for some 350 million years. It's here that we begin to notice that the other Planeteers have completely stopped being characters, but I'll complain about that more later. Um, because we cut to this crap. Starting to get on my nerves. Oh, what's a little croaking to save face? Just whipping up a regenerating froggy frappe. Ah. Dr. Blight, knowing that she needs the frog DNA to be scientifically injected into her, essentially, has taken it upon herself to begin blending the frogs and drinking it. I'm not kidding. They never show her actually putting the frogs in the blender, but there is a blender nearby, and there are a lot of frogs and their little frog prisons nearby as well. And this sludge is just called frog. And she really likes it, too. Like, she doesn't like it in the first gulp, but after that, she really comes around and starts slathering her face with it. Like, the Hanna-Barbera animators are, are weird, you know? Like, we know that already, but... I always forget exactly how weird. It's not really surprising that, like, Seth MacFarlane was, like, a writer for Hanna-Barbera, you know? The humor is very in line with him. 
Uh, the planeteers arrive in a seemingly random forest, uh, just guess, kind of taking so measurements fine. and it readings and read. looking at frogs I here. I, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt and saying that based on the map that definitely not Gaia showed them earlier, they've picked the spot most likely to be attacked because it's then immediately attacked and the whole area is lifted up and Linka, like, fucking bails, dude. Like, she gets out of there. She is gone. Leaves Wheeler to die, which is great because he does. What the? Oh! <laughs> he doesn't really. He, d he doesn't die, of course. He just gets whacked in the back of the head and is kidnapped. But, you know, I mean, it's still not good. So Mal and Dr. Blight discover that they have Wheeler tucked away in the cargo hold with the rest of the frogs. And they begin to torture. It's at this point that I have the biggest problem with the entire episode. Well, one of the biggest problems. My biggest problem, plot-wise. Dr. Blight has revealed that she is working on the Planeteer Genome Project, where she plans to alter the Planeteer's DNA with that of her scab in order to turn them into walking, living scabs, which will affect their ability to fight crime, I guess. I don't really know. They, I just, It seems like she's doing all right. My problem with this is, of course, the fact that she didn't know what DNA was at the beginning of the episode when Mal had to explain it to her. Deoxyribonucleic acid to you. Now suddenly she's got this fucking planeteer genome project. I ain't buying it. I'm not. I'm not on board with the Dr. Blight boat. It doesn't make any sense. She shouldn't be able to do this. And yes, I'm trying to apply logic to Captain Planet, and I realize that I'm the idiot for that, but... I want it to make sense. During their flight, they hit some turbulence, which causes her evil concoction that she's making to be swapped. It was very confusing and very stupid. I think I, I, think I say that at least once an episode, don't I? Now, deposit the last load of land and then head to Cave Central. Our planet Pollywogs will be arriving soon. Hey, come on! You're I feel like I do. I at, le I at least call it stupid once an episode, because it is. Arriving on the island, the Planeteers find Wheeler bound and gagged, staked to the island, which shocks them, but not as much as being shot the fuck down. <laughs> They're totally fine, by the way. Like, they get out just fine, and Mati tells his little monkey friend whose name that, uh, I don't know, it's the monkey. Suchi, stay in the geo cruiser. But Mati tells his monkey friend to stay inside of their little thing that got shot down, because it will likely be safer. I only bring that up because it comes up later. Trust me, it's necessary. The Planeteers manage to save Wheeler and run, being shot by Dr. Blight with a couple of the darts. But the non-main character Planeteers are perfectly fine. They all got blocked by their accessory. Ah, oh, the dart just nicked my armband. Lunch! Oh, saved by the belt. You know, by, by our toys. But Linka was also hit by the serum. <laughs> Leading to my next big problem, plot related with this episode. Both Wheeler and Linka are hit with this dart, which has this strange serum that causes them to go unconscious. The other planeteers leave Linka and Wheeler like 20 feet away from the campfire on the ground and then go to sleep. They don't watch them. They don't monitor them. They don't care what happens to them. They're like, oh, I'm tired. <laughs> And then when they wake up in the middle of the night, they find Wheeler and Linka's clothes empty, completely without them inside of it. And they just leave again! They don't investigate the area, they don't look to see if their rings are there, they don't call out, they just turn around and leave. And they don't come back until the plot needs them. They don't do anything other than summon Captain Planet. I don't think any of the other ones actually use their rings of power in this episode. It's a little odd to me that as soon as the Hanna-Barbera writers took over, only the white characters really started being the main characters. Like, the minorities fell off. Probably says something about Hanna-Barbera, but I, I don't know what. Wouldn't begin to know. So yes, Wheeler and Linka have become tiny because of the serum from Dr. Blight. Uh, in becoming tiny, Wheeler becomes a big old fucking creep towards Linka and starts trying to take advantage of her at kind of every opportunity, or at least implying that he wants to. Not Linka too! Dr. Demented really did it this time! Should I? <laughs> I don't know if this is a new personality trait of Wheeler's that exists in the rest of the season, but I don't like it here. It's gross, it's creepy, and if this is how Wheeler is everywhere, I, I just, I, I want to fight him. The other Planeteers, by the way, I literally mean the other Planeteers aren't in the rest of this episode until the plot needs them. There's a solid seven minutes just following Linka and Wheeler. So they have their little tiny adventure, which I'm honestly kind of a big fan of. I like seeing things from different perspectives and seeing everyday things like grass or ants or frogs or spiders from the perspective of those creatures really gives you a sense of scale that you don't find elsewhere. Everything, whenever the characters are small, is meant to look bigger, so it looks bigger, you know? Like something about this grass and something about these animals feels larger than anything else that they run across when they're normal sized. Though that may have something to do with the fact that they're 
not normally this size, so these things are way bigger than I anticipate them being. Link and Wheeler are chased by ants, they are caught by a spider, and then once they escape that, they get into a little polluted river and go down it for a little ways, and somehow that gets them to a desert. They're of course immediately attacked by a Gila monster because they can't catch a break where they're chased into a cave, and a pair of hairy little legs comes to their rescue. It's the monkey from earlier. I told you it would come back. But he rescues the two planeteers, and uh, takes them straight to the other ones. Like, he just teleports there, and we're suddenly with the other planeteers in Dr. Blight's lab. Because these three have just arrived here. They, they got here all on their own, without any problems and no difficulty. The monkey then immediately arrives with Wheeler and Linka, like, right behind them. Wame then picks up Wheeler like kind of a jerk. Like, why did he do that? Why, like, pick him up like a person. And then Dr. Blight just apparates and appears inside of her lab and snatches Wheeler, and a whole lot of stuff begins to happen. To your face! Oh no! Is my scar spreading? Mal! <gasps> oh, that's a rude awakening. Let our powers combine! They managed to summon Captain Planet instead of using their actual rings that they all have. Uh, still don't really understand that, but whatever. And Cap saves the day like always. And by that I mean he tells them to leave Wheeler to die. I'd better leap into action before she turns the Planeteers into Frogeteers! Planet Toad into Planet Puree! We better abandon ship, Planeteers! Probably the best idea in this scenario, considering Dr. Blight was threatening to drop Wheeler into a blender and kill him. It's still really funny just to watch Captain Planet look at the situation and go, Nah. Also, despite the fact that Dr. Blight's only bargaining chip in this situation was the fact that Wheeler was in mortal peril, she doesn't just lock him in the blender, she throws him into a terrarium. Captain Planet is contractually obligated to be gooped in every episode. <laughs> And then the frogs take over the controls. They're taking over the controls! It's the day of the fix! And immediately stops Dr. Blight and saves Wheeler, like he could have done from the beginning. Sometimes I can be a real sucker! It's just another frog day afternoon. And the episode wraps up. We go back to the Planeteers still playing volleyball, with Linka being still tiny and Wheeler still being a creep. For now, babe, I got you in the palm of my hand. Wheeler! Huh? <laughs> My toga! Definitely not Gaia says something about what lesson they learned today, and Dr. Blight is being forced to put back all of the frogs where they belong. With Captain Planet's help, of course. You know how I mentioned that Mal was kind of a dick, by the way, and not really on her side? Uh, it's at this point we find out that her scar was actually already healing on its own. It was already not going to cover her entire body and turn it into a scab. Mal probably lied on purpose, though he says he didn't. And uh, now that she's done the frog stuff, now it's going to turn into a giant scab and ruin her entire body. Go planet! The planetier alerts for this episode aren't bad either, one being about the dangers of UV radiation, which is something they did lightly touch upon a couple of times in the episode, and the other being about cleaning up your trash, which, you know, they saved this stupid-ass frog earlier, so I guess... There is some kind of connection. But then they mentioned the radiator fluid in the dogs again, and they just did that last episode. So, like, was there was there an epidemic of people giving radiator fluid to dogs? I don't think people did that. I don't think it was as big of a deal as Captain Planet is saying that it is. And this is just educating more terrible people on how to further hurt dogs. So maybe, maybe quit it. And that's it. We are done with Captain Planet. That was Frog Day afternoon, and I could not be happier that it is over. Let me check something. Okay, Audacity's still going strong. Had to make sure I was I was gonna have a stroke. But thank you everybody who watched this series, or just watching this episode, tuning into the shorts, or subscribing. Thank everybody so much. Um, I, I'm, I'm at a thousand now. I'm over a thousand. I'm, at, I'm almost at a thousand and fifty. And I... I'm baffled. It's crazy. I need a term to call you guys, like like scumbags or something, but genuinely, thank you. I plan on continuing a series similar to this or uh, the same format. Thank you guys so much. I expect a supercut at some point soon, and uh, y'all have a great rest of your night.